So yes, welcome to Getting Wrecked with Tim on Friday night. Um, just if you haven't been here, let me recap what we've been looking at. I started by talking about the fact that research that's been coming out over the last few years is saying that about 75% of Canadians have some type of either big T or little t trauma. And big T trauma would be what we would put in the category of abuse, severe abuse, or abandonment, um, or little t trauma is the neglect category. And that can have degrees of severity as well. And then what we saw comes out of that are 60 ways of coping with all of that. So it's some form of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn is what begins to happen because the person is in survival mode. They're trying to get their needs met. They're trying to get love. They're trying to get respect in an environment that doesn't feel safe, in an environment where they're getting hurt, neglected, abused, abandoned. And so we're going to be looking at those 60 characteristics as we go on. What I started last month was most people, when they come to the subject of trauma, begin with really presenting that the main issues coming out of trauma are physical, they're in your brain, they're in how you respond physically. And I go, yeah, there's severe stuff. And we're going to look at that starting next month. But in my experience, the greatest tragedy, the greatest thing negative that comes out of trauma is about your identity. It's an internal change in how you see yourself. So instead of seeing yourself as somebody like a child in a healthy home would that's lovable, that's valued, that has value inherently in themselves, you go, the reason I'm neglected, abused, abandoned must be because I'm bad. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. I'm not valuable. And so your identity goes from being what, what should be a positive identity in a child to a very negative identity. And what we're going to look at tonight is how that then affects all of life. So we're going to look at 25 things that come out of this shame thing. And so shame to me is the greatest negative thing that comes out of trauma. And it's the least understood, it's the least talked about, and that to me is tragic. Because for what I see all the time is people working on all the physical parts and, and, and doing lots of good stuff and working on the physical parts, but if they don't ever work with the shame, pretty soon it's like the physical part doesn't even matter, it doesn't make a difference, because they're still operating out of this core belief that they're not good enough. So that is what we're going to be developing. And then last week, you, or last month, you were all talking about, okay, are you going to get to some tools for healing as well? And then we're going to get to that. So we're going to be covering a whole lot of material tonight. So buckle up, because we got a lot of stuff to go through. So the first of the 60 characteristics, the first thing that comes out of complex trauma is shame. Okay, so we got that. What comes out of shame then is the child says basically this, anybody that gets to know me won't want to connect with me because nobody so far in my life that's got to know me has wanted to connect with me. And anybody that gets to know me, not only will they not want to connect with me, they're probably going to hurt me, they're going to abandon me, they're going to abuse me, they're going to neglect me, they won't meet my needs. So, if I want my needs met, if I want to connect with people, if I want to not get hurt again, I can't let people get to know me. So the number one priority then in the child's life changes. It's no longer I want to be authentic and love and connect, it's I want to hide. So hiding who they think they really are, which is really a lie, but it's what the mirrors have told them they are, now becomes their number one priority because their belief system says, anybody that gets to know me is going to reject me. Anybody that gets to know me is going to treat me like I've been treated so far. So now you can see that affects every relationship moving forward. 
Because if you move into every relationship now with that core belief that if I let this person get to know me, they're going to neglect me, abuse me, abandon me, and not meet my needs, well, I can't let anybody get to know me. And that messes up relationships. But they still have other priorities underneath the need to hide. And they are, I still want my needs met. I still want to be loved. I still want to be respected. But how can I get those needs met without getting hurt, without being abandoned? Ah, that's then where I have to adapt. So I'm going to hide myself, but I am going to do adaptations that hopefully will get me some love, will hopefully get me my needs met. And so what we're going to look at tonight are the adaptations that a child develops in order to try to meet these new sets of priorities in their life. So another way to look at it would be with this diagram, so you can see the real self, which they think is their real self, which isn't really, it's a distortion. It's the lies from the mirrors of their life. I have to hide that. But if I'm gonna get my needs met, then I have to create personas. I have to be a chameleon. I have to learn to act parts. I have to learn to wear masks. I have to learn to do all kinds of things to get people to like me, to get my needs met. And so what their focus now is not authenticity, their focus is fake. I have to be somebody else. But more than that, what is happening inside is not only do I have to hide myself, is I don't like myself. I wish I wasn't the way I was. So they're still believing that they're the problem. And they're hating that parts of themselves. So here now are the things that begin to come out of this shame and their characteristics of complex trauma, but it's kind of the ramifications of shame. So number one, very hard on themselves or they judge themselves harshly. So let me give you this diagram again. So you got the real self, then you got the persona, and then you have above that an ideal self. So their little brain was saying, if only I was this way, then everybody would like me. If only I was this way. And, and what it is, is this ideal, perfect person. And if I was this, then everybody would love me, nobody would hurt me, I, everybody would want to connect with me. So they've got this idealized picture in their brain of what they should be in order to be loved and accepted. So you've got hidden self, the mask that you wear, and then an ideal self, but then there's that green circle. And that's an inner critic. So what shame does is say, you're an imposter. You're hiding the real self and you're fake. You're phony. And it criticizes all the time. And then it also says, hey, you're not meeting the ideal self. So you're failing every day because you're not meeting that standard you set for what you should be like. So you're failure, failure. See, you're just proving you're that person that you're trying to run away from. So this inner critic in their brain is constantly beating them down. And then every time they fail or do something that doesn't meet their expectations or the expectations of others, that inner critic goes, I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to punish you. You don't deserve to get your needs met. You are a loser. You can't do anything that people would want a relationship with you. And they just beat themselves down, tear themselves down. So their inner critic in their head is a negative, negative person that's always finding fault with themselves. So what I want you to see from that is shame then sets up a system to feed itself. And that inner critic is the thing that keeps feeding shame and saying, see, it's true, you're a loser, you're no good, nobody's ever going to want you, and it keeps feeding the shame monster. So that inner critic, where does that come from? 
So if you go back to parents that abused a child, neglected a child, abandoned a child, what usually is part of all of that is criticism. Verbal, nonverbal, raised eyebrows, scornful looks, teasing, all kinds of things that are always saying you're not good enough, you're not good enough, this is a flaw, this is a flaw. So what happens to the child is their brain is taking everything their parent says and does and putting it in their own brain as an IP or an internal parent. So they're actually creating their own parent in their brain who is just repeating what their actual parents have said done to them. So that's where the internal critic comes from. And so that's where I get clients all the time. It's like every time I do this, it's like I hear my mom's voice in my head. And it's that mom's criticism, mom's raising her eyebrows. That's that internal critic that now resides there, but it's been reinforced for years by external critics. And the child has internalized all of that. And so now what comes out of that is parents might accept some parts of their personality, but they go, oh, you're too shy, you're too sensitive, you're too talkative. So now they like parts of themselves, but hate parts of themselves. Or they like some parts of their body, but their parents made fun of their weight or their ears or their nose or their teeth. And so now they hate parts of their body. So there's parts of themselves they accept, parts they reject. And they're like, I wish I wasn't like that. I wish that wasn't me. I wish I was somebody else. So they're always managing, I can show this part of myself, but I have to keep these parts from being exposed because if other people see these parts of my body personality they're going to tease me and make fun of me and so that becomes this internal battle that's going all the time on all the time inside of them due to shame but the big picture is they eventually they just don't like themselves um, and so that then goes to what we just talked about they have to then wear masks so if people are going to connect with me I got to be what they want me to be I got I can't be authentic I got to be somebody else and so that's where they learn to wear masks so let me just give you a, a little bit about that children growing up don't just wear masks they adopt roles that will try to get their parents to want to connect with them to love them to meet their needs and so we, over the years, they've kind of put different titles to some of the roles that children adopt. So you may have heard of these. I'll go through them very quickly. One child might become what we call the hero child, and that is they're going to be super responsible. They're going to do extra chores. They're going to be super polite, super obedient. They're going to be the perfect child. And, and the parents are going to go, wow, aren't we great parents? Look at our kids. They are an angel. Meanwhile, that child is just trying to get love. That child is just trying to keep the parents from being angry all the time. That child is just trying to get their needs met. Then you'll get a child that we call a mascot or a comedian. And so their approach is, if I keep everybody laughing, then nobody's going to get angry. If I just entertain people and tell stories and jokes and I'm funny and I'm doing pranks all the time, then it's going to make everybody like me. And people want to be my friend. And, people, and so they're trying to solve their shame. They're trying to find a way to get others to like them. So some go to the mascot comedian. Now I should say that some try all these different roles, and you may have tried all these different roles in your life, and may have settled on one that you like, or some, in some situations, they adopt one role, and in a different situation, they adopt a different role. So the third one is what we call the invisible child or the lost child. And this is the child that says, the only way to not get hurt is to be invisible. So don't have any needs. Don't try to connect with anybody. Just stay isolated. 
don't ever ask for anything. Don't ever offer your opinion because then you're going to get no's. You're going to get criticism. So let's just be a good little servant. Let's be a good little kid, but not draw attention to ourselves. Then maybe my parents will say, wow, what a wonderful child. We love that child. So some go to that. So what you can see is the child is desperately saying, what do I need to become in order to get my needs met, in order to help this family be a better family? The fourth one is what we call the problem child or the scapegoat. And they basically say, this family is sick. And I'm not going to adopt any role. I'm not going to be fake. I am going to call this family sick and I am going to call them on their crap. I'm not going to go along with their dumb rules when they're dumb. And so they just are stubbornly defiant to be real. Now, guess what the family does? They go, wow, we got a problem with this child. They're not going along with our rules. They're not going along with our agenda. They're not allowing us to get away with neglecting or abusing them. This is the problem. This is why our family is having problems is because of this child. And so that's why they call it the scapegoat. But if you look at the first three children only, and you were to go into that family, you go, wow, this is a wonderful family. Look, you got a hero here. you got a comedian here. you got this invisible little child here. None of them cause problems. They're all wonderful kids. Meanwhile, this is one hurting family. This is a messed up family where the kids are desperately trying to get their needs met and there's only one kid that's being honest and he's being called the problem. And that's where the family, instead of looking at their own stuff, the parents, instead of saying maybe we're the problem, they go, that child's the reason this, problem, this family is struggling and they never get real about their stuff because they now have a convenient scapegoat. So that is what happens in many families, sadly, where there's complex trauma that takes place. The next characteristic that comes out of shame is the people-pleasing or the fawn response. So that's the child that says, I can't fight, I can't flee, I got to live with these people that are neglecting me and hurting me, what do I need to do to get them to like me? I can't run away, I can't fight back. I'm too little for that, so let's just be what they want me to be. Let's please them. Let's say what they want me to say. Let's do what they want me to do. Never say no to them. Never get them angry. Never put your needs out there. Just take care of their needs. Do everything for them. Serve, serve, serve. Sacrifice. So the child out of desperation goes to the extreme fond response, which is people please. So what happens with that is the child becomes attuned to everybody else's emotions except their own. They become attuned to everybody else's needs, but not their own. So they get out of balance that everybody's more important than me, so let's live that way. And let's be attuned to dad's mood, let's be attuned to dad's needs, let's be attuned to dad's Emotions, let's be attuned to dad's thinking. I don't have a clue what I think. I don't have a clue what I feel. I just adapt and be what he wants me to be. And so they begin to be that people pleaser. So we talked about last time that there's a people pleasing that comes out of a healthy place, comes out of love. I want to please you because I love you, but when there's love there, I'm also willing to say no to you at times. I'm also to n willing to not please you at times if you want me to do something I shouldn't. But when it comes out of shame, it's I must please you no matter what. And the reason I'm doing it is so you'll like me. So you'll meet my needs. So I am giving in order to get. So it's not genuine love. It is actually survival dressed up like love. And that's what's happening in the people pleaser. Um, and so, sadly, in many cultures and churches, people pleasing is actually praised and validated. So you get a lot of shame-based people that thrive in these environments, but they're burning themselves out. They never say no. And 
they're sacrificing to the point of neglecting themselves. And it becomes a, a problem for their families and themselves eventually. Okay, the next one to me is a, a huge one, and I want to take a wee bit more time on it. So what comes out of shame is the child believes they have no inherent value. So they feel, I am not lovable, I don't have value. Otherwise, if I, had, if I had some value, people would want to connect with me. People would want to meet my needs. The fact that my needs aren't being met, people don't want to connect with me, I must be a zero when it comes to having value. But we're driven to need a sense of value. That's part of what human makeup is. So what begins to happen is the child adapts. How am I going to gain a sense of value? Well, I don't have it inherently, so I must get it from externals. So I, I don't have it from being, I must get it from doing. So they become, instead of a human being, a human doer. That's where their value comes from, because they don't feel it inherently. So... Let me give you quickly things that people do and you can check off if you've done any of them. So number one, let's compare myself with others. So let's find an arena that I'm pretty good at. So let's say I'm really pretty or really smart or really good at sports or whatever. I'm going to compare myself with other kids and I'll always come out on top. Oh, I'm smarter than them. Oh, I'm prettier than them. And that's then where my value comes from. And then as you get older, I'll get a job that has status, power. I'll get possessions and money. And that, I will compare myself and come out on top. Now, some kids weren't able to compete in any of those arenas. But the one area where they seemed to get attention was when they were bad. That was the only time their parents wanted to connect with them was when they wanted to punish them. And so they said, well, it's better to get some attention than no attention at all, some connection than no connection at all. So if being bad gets me connection and attention, I'll be the baddest of the bad. And that's where my value is going to come from as being a bad boy. And so some do that. Some find that in religion. I'm going to be more spiritual than everybody else by doing more spiritual checklist stuff and that's where I'm going to get a sense of value so what you can see from that is that leads to a midlife crisis so what happens if all your value came from your body and your beauty and then you hit 40 and then 50 you go oh, I'm losing it and that's where we get the term cougars and puma um, where you still got it when you're 40 50 and 60 um, but that's what's happening. As soon as you base your value on an external, there's always the danger of losing it. And so now you live with insecurity. Now you have to keep trying to prove yourself. Now everybody that comes along that's also pretty, now is a threat. I can't be a friend with them because they're the competition. In fact, they're the enemy. I need to put them down. I need to build myself up so it leads to all kinds of stuff but what you're really doing is saying the solution to shame is to be superior to everybody and I would choose the arena so that's what some do another thing that many do is the first thing that they got validated for as a child is what causes them to feel that's where my value comes from so if they got told you're so pretty or you're so smart, or you're so good at sports, then they go, okay, I'm going to pursue that, because that's what's what I'm good at, that's what gives me value. Some, the first time they got laughed, people laughed at like they were funny. Now they go, wow, people think I'm funny, so now they're going to try to be funny all the time, because that's their source in their mind of what gives them value. And then common one is the way to have value is to help people if I'm helping people then I must have value so now I'm going to go rescue needy people 
I'm going to go help needy people. So again, that can come from a very good, loving place, but you can see that that can come from shame, trying to find value. And so their value now always comes from needing to rescue people, needing to help people. But that means they always got to be finding somebody sicker than them. And, and that can lead to some problems. One that some people find is the only time they got attention, the only time parents kind of heaped love on them is when they were sick or when they were in pain. And so they go, oh, okay, I must have value when I'm in pain, when I'm sick. So I'll just always have a new crisis, I'll always have a new problem, I'll always have a new sickness, because then people flock and give me attention. So what you can see again is shame says I can't develop good feelings about myself because I feel a zero. So I need to get others to give me positive attention. And if they give me positive attention, then that makes me feel good and that maybe will solve my shame. It doesn't work, but that makes sense to a child. Another one is to be a martyr, and that is sacrifice, sacrifice, give, give, be tired all the time. Oh, I'm just so exhausted after all I've done this week. And everybody goes, oh, you're such a saint. You're such a wonderful person. And they go, hmm, that gives me value. And then your career, your position, all of those become things. Becoming a parent. Sadly, I work with so many people with huge, huge shame, and the reason they wanted to become a parent was to have somebody that needed them. Somebody that would love them back. And I go, that is so tragic. Because that actually creates complex trauma in the little child because now they feel they've got to be a parent to their needy parent. And so that happens for many people. And what happens with people that do that is as the child grows up and the child begins to have other friends and doesn't need them as much, it creates all this insecurity in the parent. And then they try to control the child. They try to draw them back in so that the child needs them again. And it sets up all kinds of terrible dynamics. Others just become spotlight seekers. So they are always wanting to be in the limelight, wanting attention, always trying to tell stories, exaggerating their stories just so people are noticing them. So all of those are attempts to gain value that so many people do. And so the key piece, and we're going to look at it at the end, is until a person begins to know and believe, choose to believe that I have inherent value, regardless of what I do or do not do, shame will continue to rule them. And they will continue to look for their value from externals, and it will never fix the problem. Okay, the next one, and this one gets into the relationship, and I'm going to develop this one the most, and then I'm going to go through a whole bunch real quickly. Codependency comes out of complex trauma and out of shame. So one way to understand codependency, because it's an overused term, it's one of those terms like shame that people really don't understand. It's Codependency is how two shame-based people relate to each other. That's codependency. So codependency is all about shame. And it's a dance of two shame-based people trying to avoid getting hurt by the other person, trying to get the other person to meet their needs without revealing who they really are. And that is what we mean by codependency. So think of what shame basically, not feeling value, the worst thing for a shame -based, many shame-based people is if I'm in a relationship, that means somebody wants me. That means I must have some value. If I'm not in a relationship, that must mean nobody wants me, which means I have no value. Therefore, logical, I must always be in a relationship. And so that's where coming out of shame, there's a type of codependency that's actually a relationship addiction. I need to be in a relationship to feel I have value, to feel I am desirable. And that is what drives many, many people. 
So, let me give you kind of how this comes out of shame. So you got shame in the lighter blue box. People are going to respond or try to adapt to shame in kind of two main ways. So the one is the person that just gives into it and says, I'm a loser, the inferior, the dark blue. And it's like they don't even try to compensate. The other is the person that we've described that I'm going to try to prove I'm better than others. I'm going to help others. I'm going to have a good job position, all of those things, but I have to be superior. What then happens? So both of them are driven by shame, but can you see how they then attract each other? So now the superior person, they go, I'm going to find an inferior person, and so the kind of the pinkish boxes i'm going to help them i'm going to rescue them that's going to make the inferior person feel oh somebody noticed me somebody is helping me oh that just feels so good and that seems to solve their shame and then what does that person do they go back to that superior person you are wonderful thank you you're the greatest person around and that to the person who's trying to be superior seems to solve their shame because they're getting all this praise and accolades and so they're feeding each other trying to solve their shame so that's part of the dance okay so here's that's the beginning that's when it all seems to be working but it doesn't work so what happens after a while both start getting discontent both aren't feeling in love with each other anymore. Both aren't excited about each other anymore. They both start complaining. They both start shutting down a bit more. So back to the previous one, just so you can, again, appreciate what's happening. The person who's superior, when they meet that person that they see as inferior, the needy person, they make that person the center of their world. They make time for them, they sacrifice, they listen for hours to them, they buy them gifts, they make them the center of the world. And that's what makes the inferior, inferior person feel so much love and value, and it seems to solve their shame. Once it stops working, and now they're discontent, the superior person goes, I'm the boss around here, and they become a narcissist. And it's all about my needs now, and you better be taking care of me. And so now you have conflict. Potential neglect, abuse, all kinds of different things come out of that. The biggest fear of shame, if we go back to the shame thing, is you're going to abandon me. And so what happens when it starts breaking down? Uh-oh, I'm going to lose the other person. And so we're fighting but I can't let them go. I can't end this relationship. So let's, let, let's try to get a little help to fix the crises and, and, and maybe get our marriage straightened out. But nobody's dealing with the shame. They're just fixing all these little crises. So you get conflict that happens because it's not working. The superior person gets angry at the other person. The other person, the inferior person, gets full of fear that they're going to be abandoned. So what do they do? They give up their needs. I'll serve you, I'll do whatever you want. Uh, and, and they're extra attentive, they do extra things for the other person. They give up more of their needs. The next conflict, give up more needs, give up more needs, give up more needs. Trying to make this work, and that's the dance. And so, after a conflict, everybody's on their best behavior again, and it seems to go back to the honeymoon where everybody's happy again, but it's not working, and it breaks down so over time, what begins to happen is the honeymoon periods get shorter and shorter. The conflicts get more intense, last longer, and it just keeps breaking down, breaking down. But they won't let go. Some eventually say, well, it's going to break down eventually. I'm just going to go move on to another affair. And this is where it gets really interesting is a lot of people don't end the relationship and then sit there being a single person again. They get somebody else in the wings 
so that the day they end it, they can move on to the next one. So they're not alone. Shame driving all of it. And so that's where the needy person, as they feel it falling apart, they can become even more needy. They can become clingy. They can even create crises trying to draw the other person back in to rescue them. The superior person, they can try to create a crisis, try to get the other person sick so they need them to draw it back in. So they're all trying to keep this together, but it just keeps breaking down. So let me just say this. We do a whole series on codependency because it's such a big thing. What I want you to understand tonight is just the basics of it and that it's all driven by shame. And it's two people with shame who've responded in different ways that are attracted to each other. But until they actually deal with the shame, they're going to keep doing a dance that's gradually breaking down more and more. Okay, so I'm going to go really quickly here through the next one. So you can see shame then leads to people will value me and respect me and meet my needs if I'm perfect. So you end up with a perfectionist. But then you get the characteristic where I've worn masks all my life and hidden my real self, and I hate my real self. I don't even know who I am. I don't know if the mask is the real me. I don't know what the real me is because I've hidden everything. And so most people that come out of shame don't know who they really are. Next one is hiding myself is basically... I got to keep me a secret and I got to lie about myself. But then if I'm going to keep a relationship with you and make you want to stay connected to me, I got to tell you lies too. And so lying becomes part of what is necessary to not get hurt, to try to get your needs met. Some people go to, I'm shame, I'm going to be hidden. The best way to do that is isolate from everybody. Some isolate geographically, like I'm just not going to have any friends, I'm not going to do anything with people, never socialize. Others, they isolate behind building walls around their heart. So I'm going to be an extrovert and a social butterfly, but I'm not going to let anybody get close. That's a form of isolation. Another characteristic that you can see comes out of shame is, I don't ever want to be a burden or a pain. Because if I have needs and if I have special needs and I'm a burden, that's really going to make people not like me. So I can never tell people my problems. I can never ask people to help me because then I'd be a pain. So they don't do that. Some go to, if people knew my needs, they'd never want to meet them because I have no value. So how am I going to get my needs met? I better learn to manipulate people. So shame leads to being a manipulator to try to get your needs met. So what I want you to understand is we see all of those kind of through a moral lens and go, oh, that's bad. But you see that child's just trying to survive? They're not trying to be bad. They're just saying, what do I have to do with this belief that I'm no good and have no value? How am I going to survive to get my needs met? That leads to what we've talked about briefly, trouble saying no Because if I say no, I might get people mad at me or upset with me and they're not going to like me and they're going to reject me and shame just can't do with that. The next one is we have this longing for connection and intimacy, but we're afraid to death of connection and intimacy. Because if they get to know me, they're going to reject me. So I want intimacy, but I'm afraid of it. So what do people do? Let's create fake feelings of intimacy. So just think of sports intimacy or barroom intimacy. Everybody feels real close and warm and we're bros and we're a team and let's all hug each other and pat each other on the bum and all of that kind of stuff goes on. I don't have a clue who you are. You don't have a clue who I am, but we create feelings of closeness. And so that's what they try to do, but it doesn't satisfy because it's not true healthy intimacy. Fear of abandonment I talked about. And then you can see huge jealousy issues. 
So basically, shame says, I'm not much of a catch. You're going to find somebody better than me. So now I'm afraid you're looking. Jealousy. Every time you talk to somebody, oh, oh, they're probably found that they're better than me. They're going to leave me. Jealousy, jealousy, jealousy. Deep longing for validation comes out of this shame need. Would somebody please tell me I have value? It's just a deep longing. Many would never say that, but they feel it. Hypersensitive to disrespect. So shame basically has this belief. Everybody that looks at me looks down on me because I'm a zero. So now I will interpret what everybody says and does as being a judgment. So there's a hypersensitivity to disrespect. Hypersensitivity, hypersensitive to criticism as well. And then image is more important than reality. So shame says I have no inherent value. So my value has to come from externals. So that means my image that I present to the world is more important than who I really am. So let's focus on creating an external image that I can present and not even focus on our internal world because that's broken beyond repair. So all of that goes into image. Many insecurities and then promise more than they can deliver. So a shame-based person says, if you're going to like me, i got to promise you a whole bunch of stuff. i got to kind of make it sound like I'm better than I am, that I can perform more than I actually can do. So they promise more than they can deliver, so they make all kinds of promises, then they spend half their time trying to figure out how to wiggle out of those promises. And then, super responsible, the hero child, or super irresponsible, I'm a screw-up, I'm going to fail anyways, so why even try? Let's just do nothing. And then, tending towards being rigid, extreme dogmatic in their thinking, so I gain my value from being very opinionated. Okay, so that's very quickly 25 characteristics. So we got through 25 out of the 60 in one night. Let me quickly go to the healing. And we do a whole series on shame as well with two talks that I do on healing. If you want to watch them on, on YouTube, you can. Um, but I just very quickly, self-awareness. Begin to understand what triggers those shame beliefs and feelings. So what triggers you to feel shame or to start thinking shame lies or to start beating yourself up? Understand those triggers, so self-awareness, and then understand, once you're triggered, how do you behave? How does it affect you? How does it affect your actions? How does it affect your thinking? How does it affect other emotions? As you begin to understand your triggers and your patterns, what's going to happen is the next time you're triggered and you start to act, you're going to go, oh, shame must have been triggered, because that's what happens when I get triggered by shame. Wonder what's going on here. And you can stop it before it progresses, and you can get to what is going on so that you can begin to heal it. Second thing, replace the lies that shame has taught you about yourself with the truth. So there's an element of healing from shame that is cognitive. It's your thinking. It is changing that. Now what's important is that's only one piece of the healing, a lot of people try to put all their eggs in that one basket and say, just change your thinking. And that'll fix it. That's one part. You've got to do a whole bunch more, though, if you're going to actually heal from shame. Third one, gain a sense of what gives me value. I do have inherent value. So we know this. If you look at a little baby that comes into the world... It can't hold a job. It just burns through your money like crazy. It takes all your time and doesn't give you anything back but poop and barf and all of that. And we love them. They can't perform, but they have inherent value. So we know that humans have inherent value. That's why we treat babies the way we do. 
And that's why we treat elderly people who can no longer keep a job, who have Alzheimer's, we still care for them because they have value. So you do too. So that's where you begin is by saying, I don't feel value, but I know I have it. And that's a good enough place to begin. Next one, and this is important. So we're going to look next time at our brain. And we have a limbic brain, which is our emotional brain, and then the cortex brain, which is our thinking adult brain. The limbic brain is the child brain, and that's where shame is. And it creates the feelings of shame and the distorted beliefs of shame. So what happens when I get triggered is my limbic brain makes your loser feel true. What I need to do is go to my cortex and say, but I know I have value. That's the truth. My limbic brain is lying to me right now, so I'm going to believe the truth. Second thing is your limbic brain says, treat yourself the way you're feeling right now. So if you're feeling like a loser, treat yourself like a loser. Beat yourself up. The cortex says, no, you have value. Treat yourself with respect, even though you feel like you don't deserve respect. And so the battle begins by getting out of my limbic brain into my cortex and acting based on what I know is true, even though it doesn't feel true. And I treat myself with respect, even though something in me wants to beat me, myself up and put myself down. I choose to treat myself with respect. So what we often say to clients is, you're acting your way through your cortex to a re-education of your limbic brain, to a new way of feeling about yourself. But it has to start in your cortex. Next one, choose to accept yourself. Choose to accept the body that you have. Choose to accept the personality that you have. It's a choice. It begins there. And that is very difficult, but it is an important part. So healing shame isn't feeling better about yourself as the first step. Healing shame is choosing to accept the package, who you are. And that's where it begins. Next, accept your past. Many people look back and it feeds their shame. I am a loser. Look at all the crap that happened to me. Look how nobody wanted to be with me. And they just keep feeding off of the, all of that negative stuff in their past. And what I say to people is, you can't go back and change your past. You can't go back and get new parents. You can't go back and get a different childhood. Accept that and learn from it. And let it guide you to actually growing. And then accept the slow growth process. We all wish there was a magical pill somewhere that would instantly heal shame. Do you want to know how long it takes to heal shame? The rest of your life. There's no magic pill. It is the slowest healing part of the trauma journey. And when you think of it, it's the first thing that started right from infancy, that belief. And so it's not going to heal quickly. It's going to heal up, down. You're going to make progress. You're going to regress. It's messy, but it heals. So what you're going to find as you grow is you're going to begin to get triggered less often. And then when you are triggered, you're going to be able to process through that trigger quickly Whereas in the past, that trigger might have taken you down, spiraling down for two days. Now you can get through it in half an hour. And then as you keep growing, those triggers will become less intense. Because you're quickly going to be able to go, that's their crap, not mine. And so it's not going to bother you as much. So accept the slow journey. And then learn to forgive yourself and deal with this internal critic. A lot of people find it helpful to see that internal critic as kind of somebody else and have an argument with it and say, would you shut up because you're telling me lies right now and I don't have to listen to you. So learn to deal with that. So here's a big piece of all of this that I want you to see. 
many parents use what we call shame-based parenting, which is the way to motivate a child is to tear them down, criticize them. That'll make them want to improve. And that works short-term. And studies have shown that. But if you do that as the norm, it eventually beats the child down so they don't want to. So what happens to a lot of people when they come into working on themselves is they still try to shame-based parent themselves. They beat themselves down, thinking that's going to motivate them to want to change. And they actually feed their guilt, they feed their shame, hoping it's going to motivate them to change. It doesn't. So there's over 100 different tests that have been done to say what is the one main thing that causes lasting change and a desire to change, people are expecting shame. Guess what it was? Self-compassion. Be kind to yourself. Forgive yourself. Say, hey, I can't go back and redo that. I'm not going to beat myself up, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to change. I'm not saying it was okay, but the solution is not beating myself up. The solution is changing. So learn that self-compassion that is such a an important part. And then find accurate mirrors. People that reflect back to you a more accurate picture of who you are. And that means boundaries with unhealthy mirrors. So if you still have family that is constantly criticizing, putting you down, you might have to have some boundaries with family. See them less often. Say, if you're going to talk to me that way, I'm not going to be hanging around. But you need boundaries. So what I see all the time is people come into our program and they heal tremendously in their shame. Then they go visit their parents for Thanksgiving or Christmas. And they all come back just beaten like a little puppy again. And what I tell people is, shame when you heal initially is so fragile. It can be undone in a heartbeat if you're back around the wrong mirror. So you're going to have to look at mirrors or boundaries with unhealthy mirrors. And then connect with healthy people. Shame is healed. Bottom line, what, what's my goal been? Nobody wants to com- connect with me, so I'm going to hide. I'm going to connect with people. And when I find people want to connect with me, it's going to start healing shame. So healthy connection where I risk starting to be authentic, but with safe people. Don't start trying to be authentic with unsafe people. They'll just make your shame worse. Then learn more about yourself. Grieve your past, because a lot of crap happened that shouldn't have. Keep your conscience clear, because guilt now will feed into shame if you allow guilt to continue. Learn to give and serve and this is tricky with shame because that can take you back to externals but there's some healing that comes when you're serving and you go my life is making a difference in others and then the spiritual mirror that we talked about can be such a healing source for for many people so that is the shame healing let me say a final piece about it Sadly to me, many complex trauma families want their children to be humble. But their definition of humility is actually shame. That the child should think of themselves as not as good as others. Put themselves down. Never get, never talk about their accomplishments. So their definition of humility is actually the shame. The cure to shame is actually true humility. And what's true humility? It is seeing myself accurately. It is seeing that I am just as important as you. My needs are just as important as your needs. So if I'm in a relationship with you, we're going to learn how to meet your needs and my needs. And we're going to learn boundaries. And I'm going to learn to stand up for myself. And I'm going to learn to talk about my needs. And so humility is what actually heals shame but for people that come out of complex trauma humility is scary because every time they tried to do that as a child 
they got humiliated. And humiliation is their nose was rubbed in it. They were made fun of. And it was painful. It fed shame. And so it's an important process for them to learn true humility, which is see myself accurately, see my value, stand up for my value, but recognize that we're equal. So that's the shame part. So I've gone through it very quickly. Um, but that's the end of part one. We're going to take a break. And then after the break, Karen will bring us back in with some singing. And then I'm going to do the Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, um, and we're not offended by that. We don't want you to feel pressured to have to sit through some Christian part. If, if that's not of interest to you, don't feel the need to come back in after the break. But we'll take a break now, and then you'll hear Karen start up when we're ready to go again. So I don't know if you've ever given any thought to how does shame change how people think about God? It's a super important thing. Um, and that's what I want to talk about. But to give you the context for it, if you're to properly understand much of the Bible, especially at the time of Jesus, is to really understand that it wasn't just one or two shame people that were living in a culture. It was a culture that was full of shame people and become a shame-based culture. And what happens with a shame-based culture is it affects how you think about God because what we see in the first half, I think everybody looks down on me. I think everybody's finding fault in me. I don't think anybody's going to meet my needs or love me just the way I am. i got to earn it. And so when Jesus came into the world, the whole religion, led by the Pharisees, had become distorted. Judaism had become distorted as a shame-influenced religion that affected their view of God. And so much of what Jesus did was to try to correct the view of God, to help people see God accurately again. And so the stories and much that he taught was to deal with that shame distortion of God and to give an accurate picture of God. And so that's what I want to do, is kind of help you see some of the stuff that Jesus did. But let me give it to you, this context, before I get to it. There's two challenges when we think about God from a Christian perspective, it, and that is what we call God's imminence and God's transcendence. So God's transcendence is God is infinite, God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, God is massive. God's imminence is God's my father, God's close. So he's big, infinite, but he's close. Guess what shame gravitates towards? God's transcendence. Let's make this God big. Now there's a second factor that happens with complex trauma and one's view of God and shame. I, have over the years, began to notice a pattern and that people's perspective of God was similar to that of their parents. So God was like their parents. So if they grew up with neglect, an abandonment, angry parents. They ended up with a God that didn't care about them, that was angry, that was always criticizing and judging them. So we tend to form a perspective of God often that resembles our parents is where we begin. And then if we have shame, that just causes us to see God as out there, big, indifferent, doesn't care, I gotta earn his love. All of that shame is affecting that and so that to me is so sad and every religion every spiritual movement if the people leading it aren't healthy and they have their own shame it's gradually going to distort the picture of god and you're going to end up sadly with a whole bunch of misrepresentations of god so let me start with what jesus taught in matthew 12 he was quoting, he was saying, this is what I'm about. But he was quoting from the prophets from the Old Testament. 
And he was borrowing from them. So he said, look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved whom, who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him. So it's describing the Messiah. And he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. So what had happened at, when Jesus came is they thought when the Messiah came, he would be this loud-spoken, in-your-face. He would set up justice. He would set everything right. He would confront. He would correct everything. He was going to be that take-charge, powerful Messiah. He says, that's not, that's not what I'm about. He says, I won't crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering piece of flax is what the, the original language says. So let me explain that to you. A shepherd boy was out on the field, bored. So what does he do? He needs to make a flute. And he's going to learn to play the flute, and that's how he's going to entertain himself. Well, easy to do that, because in Israel, just like around here, ditches are full of reeds. They were billions of them. You couldn't even sell them. They were so plentiful. They had zero value. But you could make something out of them. So what the boy would do is he'd cut off a reed, make a little flute, and play on it. But what happened as he played on it is saliva would begin to break the reed down, and soon it was no good. He couldn't play anymore. So that's what Jesus is talking about, a weak reed or a bruised reed. That's got that saliva, so it no longer can play music. It can no longer perform sound. So what would a little shepherd boy do? Should he repair it? No, there's billions of reeds around here. Throw it away, make another one. Who cares about that broken reed? It's of no use anymore. Get rid of it. And that was the mindset of the religion of that day. Oh, they're broken. God's going to judge them. Let's get rid of them. Let's go somewhere else and Jesus comes along and says what do I do with bruised reeds broken reeds that can no longer play music do I throw them out because humans are cheap like there's billions on this planet there's always more I can go invest in no I take a bruised reed and I make it play music again that's what that verse is saying and so what Jesus is saying is what does God do with something that everybody has considered not of value anymore? He restores it. What the shame people think? I have no value anymore. And God says, I don't get rid of you like everybody else might do. I restore that. So the same as back then when you wanted a light, you didn't have necessarily candles back then, but you had oil and you put a piece of flax straw in it and that was your wick and so flax straw grew everywhere flax was very plentiful they made linen out of it and so what happens when that flax straw started to burn down and flicker oh you just got rid of it because there's flax straw everywhere and jesus says what do i do with that flax straw that life that is not giving light anymore that is breaking down i don't get rid of it i restore it so that's a beautiful thing he says right up front that this is what God is like. He takes a special interest in the very people everybody else is wanting to discard because they're so plentiful. So that, right up front, he is giving a solution to shame. Okay, now the next one, to me, I just love. Um, so I got to tell you, Jewish marriage custom so back then they had arranged marriages so two dads would get together and they were checking out son daughter and they were checking out okay he's come from a good family good job education all of the credentials and then the fathers would get together and then they'd negotiate how many pigs and chickens and all of that dowry stuff um, is your daughter worth and, and they would come to an agreement in the marriage was arranged so the next step was the young boy or the and they were teenagers back then about 14 or 15 years old they would bring them together 
And the boy would give his little prepared speech where he would tell the girl that he was working for his father and this was his goal in life and blah, 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 all of the stuff that he would tell her. And then he would say, he'd take a cup of wine and he would hold it out to her. And that was basically proposing. And if she took the wine and drank from it, then she was accepting his proposal of marriage and saying, I will marry you. So it was all based on him offering a cup of wine, her drinking it. Okay, keep that in mind. If she said, took the wine and drank it and agreed to his thing, then he would say, okay, I'm going to go away then for about a year and prepare a house for us to live in. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Arab countries or Israel, Remember when my wife and I went, we're going down the road and there's these nice houses, but outside is all of this rebar sticking out of the roof. And I go, what in the world's going on here? And they go, oh, well, that's for the son to build on a room on the house so when he gets married, he can live there. And so he would go build a room on his father's house for his bride. And then when the room was finished, he'd come and get his bride to get married and they'd move back. Okay, got all that in your mind? Jesus' final meal called the Passover with his disciples. They had four cups of wine. Now let me read you what he says to his disciples. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in you. There's more than enough room in my father's house. If not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything's ready, I'm going to come and get you so that you will be with me forever. Do you realize what was going on in the disciples' head? Because what had just happened is Jesus had offered, so at the Passover, there's four cups of wine. So one of them became the communion service. Do this in remembrance of me. But one of the other cups was a proposal of marriage. And the disciples are hearing him say, I'm going to go to my father's house now and prepare a place and I'm going to come and get you. I'm going, he's proposing marriage to us. Now think about what was going to happen to those disciples. They were going to go out. Peter was going to deny that he even knew Jesus. All the others were going to abandon Jesus and run away. They were going to fail the worst they'd ever failed in their life. And Jesus is saying, I want to be with you forever. I love you. I want to marry you. So that very ceremony, I think, would have come back to the disciples over and over again. Every time their shame got triggered, but he proposed to us. He's gone away to prepare a place for us. We do have value. He does want to connect. And so the healing of shame that would have come out of that would have been tremendous. And so it's, to me, a powerful, when you understand the custom and then read John 14, it's like, wow, that is mind-blowing what is happening. Okay, the next one I just love, and this one's actually based on the Old Testament, but Israel had forgotten about it. So can a mother forget her nursing child? And, and so the answer is not likely, but in some cases, yes. Okay, so a mother's love is the strongest love. It's the most perfect love we know, but it's not perfect. Mothers can still fail. Okay? Can she feel no love for the child she was born? Possibly. But even if that were possible, God says, I will not forget you. My love is even greater than a mother's love. So that's his point. I will never forget you. Then he says this, see, I have written you on the palms of my hands. And this is fascinating. Um, so you think of a soldier going to war. What is one of the very important things that they want to do going to war is get a picture of their wife and children, um, and they, every day they're going to look at that picture. Okay? Or in our culture today, some are going to get a tattoo with their kids' names and their wife's names on it. And every time they undress, they're going to see that tattoo, and it's going to remind them of what they love the most. Okay, so here's the picture here. In a farming culture, where you work all day with your hands, 
what is the part of your body that you are going to see the most? Your hands. So you didn't have pictures back then. You didn't tattoo names on your body. Well, you could. Where would you put it? The place you're going to see the most. And so what does God say? I tattooed you on the palms of my hands. So as I'm working every day, guess what I'm seeing? You. Guess what I'm thinking about? You. Every minute of the day. So in the most powerful way God could describe love, he does it in Isaiah 49, I tattoo you on the palms of my hands in the place I'm going to see the most. And then the final one, Zephaniah 3. The Lord your God is living among you. He's a mighty Savior. He'll take delight in you with gladness. The fear of shame is if you want a relationship with me, you're doing it out of obligation. You're doing it because you have to. You're not excited. You just do it. What does this say? I delight in you. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with songs. And so what God is saying is, when I see you, when I think of you, it's not, oh, I got to talk to them again. Oh, I got to love them again. It's, I'm excited. I delight over them. I sing about it. And so everything that Jesus says in his ministry and then the rest of the Bible when you look supports is you have value to God. God loves you, delights in you, and that becomes such a healing thing for shame. So those are a couple of things just for you to, to go away and meditate on and hopefully it blesses your heart. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you for these wonderful parts of the Bible that often we don't see through our Western eyes, but when we understand the context, they just come alive and they're so rich and so healing, and I pray that you would just bring healing to hearts tonight. Amen. Karen's going to sing a final song, and then our evening will be over. Thank you so much for coming.